Uh, the kids, some of the kids aren't staring at the teacher intently. Jason is not. He's leaving. Go ahead. Doing physics. Remember, did, oh, remember we was doing physics last time? Yeah. You can probably do that at your house. Um, anyways, um, the, the, the biggest concern you kind of have on this test is chapter 17. Um, chapter 17 includes a lot of things that we did not talk about in class. And there's probably at least 10 questions on that chapter. Now, some of the things in the chapter involve abolition, but the chapter in general is about the South and what life was like in the antebellum South. And what defines life in the antebellum South is slavery. So there's questions about, you know, why did slavery become so important to the, to the South? And, and, and what were we, remember what we said was central to sort of, you know, the transformation of slavery from being a, you know, a necessary evil to a positive good is kind of, you know, something that wasn't, I mean, the transformation of attitudes in the country about slavery was not something that people woke up in the morning and said, okay, today's the day we consider slavery to be a positive good. Yesterday was a necessary evil. But central to sort of this transformation, you know, the, the, you know, the, the sort of slavery taking root in the South, deeply being entrenched in, in Southern culture and ideology to the point where they're defending it, what did we associate with that, technologically? Yes. The cotton gin. Cotton gin. Ms. Now, Nima, please call 5741. Ms. You know, Nima, there's only maybe a question or two about the cotton gin, but I, but I did want to you know, re-emphasize to you the importance of the cotton gin in, in, um, in, in, in terms of solidifying slavery. You know, I mean, you, know, well, you guys know all about it from Mr. Wheel and short staple cotton and how important short staple cotton was and the necessity of having some kind of technological device that would allow it to be processed. And therefore, the labor that, that produced that cotton became more valuable, hence slave labor became more valuable, hence slavery became more important. And then, you know, we get sort of this transformation. So central to that is cotton. But another interesting aspect, and this is asked about on the test, is the whole demographics of the South. And demographics means, you know, the population distribution, that most people in the South were not large slaveholders. That there were only a small number of large slaveholders. There was a more significant number of small slaveholders, but most white people in the South didn't own any slaves at all. And so, to some extent, the question is going to be, why do these people feel compelled to defend an institution which they're not actively participating in? Well, one of the reasons is, you know, they aspired to, to the wealth of the plantation owners and they saw the door, you know, the, the way to get there is through slavery. And the other is, as long as there were slaves beneath them, they had somebody that they were better than. You know, and there were, you know, the white aristocratic southerners that dominated the government of the southern states, you know, played on racial prejudice. I mean, do you want, you know, the slaves to be liberated? Where's that going to leave you? Where's that going to leave your opportunity? You know, so... You know, there are questions about that, and then there's certainly questions about, a few questions about what, you know, life was like for slaves, what motivated them. The comparison between free labor and slave labor in terms of motivation. You know, if, if you have a slave and you want the slave to work, I mean, if you think about it, if I'm a slave, my incentive is to do the least possible I can do. You know, why, why would I want to work hard? I mean, I'm going to work hard for you. I mean, I'm going to be cared for by the plantation owner. So I want to do the least amount of work I can get away with in order to maintain, you know, my status. Now, if you want me to get me to do more, how are you going to get me to do that? Well, you're going to threaten me, maybe, maybe beat me, you know. Whereas in the North, Northern laborers had an incentive to do more because they got more. And so they distinguish between slave and free labor in that regard. And, you know, then eventually that unit, you know, that chapter gets into abolition. And remember, there's, there's sort of these, this movement in abolition. There is a movement to abolish slavery that goes right up to Garrison. And that movement is embodied by the American Colonization Society. And remember, the American Colonization Society wanted gradual Compensated. Mrs. Elizabeth, please call 5742. 
5742. Gradual compensated emancipation with um, colonization. Now, when the American Colonization Society fails, Garrison and others come along and say, oh, no, 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 um, slavery should be immediately abolished. Those who participate in slavery should not be rewarded with compensation, and there should be no recolonization. And these people were called the immediate or radical abolitionists. Now, remember, this is what launches really the, the, the modern, I don't, I don't want to say modern abolition movement, but the, but the, 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 the abolition movement as we kind of know it. And what was Garrison's uh, publication called? We should know this should be part of your citizenship test, yes? The Liberator. The Liberator, right? Garrison published The Liberator. That symbolic publication of The Liberator, January 1st, 31, is the beginning of, you know, the, the radical abolition movement. Now, who was Nat Turner and how did he connect to Garrison? Who was Nat Turner and how did he connect to Garrison? That is an outstanding question for Honey. I'm so happy I asked it. And since you're the first one that went into my eyesight, I will ask you to respond. Aww. Who was Nat Turner and, and how does he connect to Garrison? Aww. You know who the second person that came into my eyesight was? Emery. <laughs> right up the line. Right? Go ahead, Emery. Who was Nat Turner and how did he connect to Garrison? He did indeed lead a, 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 I guess you would call it a successful, somewhat successful slave rebellion. What was his connection to Garrison? Um, they said that the Southern people tried to argue that the Liberator, like, he gave him the idea to kill the other people. Inspired him to behave in the way that he did. Any evidence to support that? No. No evidence to support that. But Southerners increasingly saw the abolition movement as a threat to their safety and security, inspiring slaves to revolt. Now. If, if they thought that in 1831, what did they think in 1859 when Brown, an abolitionist, John Brown, an abolitionist, actually did attempt to inspire a slave rebellion, which we talked about today. Remember, all along, the South was somehow trying to connect abolition to encouraging their slaves to rebel. Brown comes along and brings that to fruition which, you know, is one of the things that catapults them eventually towards uh, seceding. There are other questions about, you know, abolitionists, Wendell Phillips, um, um, Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, um, are prominent abolitionists, white and black, that you should have a familiarity with, um, that participated in the abolition movement. And so in chapter 17 in your book, if I was going to do something tonight, I would at least go look at the notes from, you know, the internet, um, you know, the, 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 the cliff notes about chapter 17. And if I hadn't read it already, I would, I would go back and read it. Because that's where you could be most likely to run into questions that we did not have in class. Now, after, you know, we, we talked about abolition, we kind, of, we kind of said, well, how does this issue, because I think when we left abolition, we said this, look, most northern did not consider abolition to be a legitimate movement for a number of reasons. You know, most Northerners look towards the abolitionists as dangerous radicals. We talked about, you know, Northern persecution of Garrison and other abolitionists. And so we said, well, how then does slavery, this issue of slavery, end up being so instrumental in dividing the Union? If most, if, 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 if besides a small cadre of abolitionists, most people in the, in the country believe that slavery was okay where it already existed, how does it sort of explode? Well, we said it's not necessarily slavery that becomes the issue. It is the extension of slavery, the spread of slavery that becomes an issue. Well, how does this become an issue? Well, this becomes an issue because of Texas and Mexico. Now, and so we eventually got into chapter 18 in your text, which, which kind of brings Polk into the picture brings expansion into the picture, brings Texas into the picture, brings Mexico into the picture, the Mexican War into the picture, and the Mexican Session into the, the picture. And so that's in chapter 18. One thing, though, in chapter 18, in the beginning of that chapter, there's a discussion about America's kind of um, expansion. 
And I mean, and, and, and the notion of manifest destiny. Oh, incidentally, Courtney, you have been a student of manifest destiny for quite some time. If you were to